When you've been hurt or experienced real heartbreak or betrayal, it's so hard then to not fall into thought spirals. Now, let me explain what I mean by thought spirals. I will have a fear usually, like I'll see something and I'll, I'll fear like, oh no, and I can instantly jump, jump to worst case scenario. I've, I, I'm an expert at worst case scenario. <laughs> if you ever have a moment where you wanna know what is the worst case scenario, I'm your girl, call me. I can think of a worst case scenario like that so quickly. Now, I used to be able to control jumping to worst case scenarios hmm. by saying to myself, worst case scenarios don't usually happen, Lisa. You know, like just because they didn't return your phone call doesn't mean they've been in a horrific car accident, right? Mm. But I have experienced so many worst case scenarios actually happening in the past 10 years when my family has gone through so much hurt and heartbreak mm. that now I cannot control my thought spirals by saying, most of the time, worst case scenarios don't happen because I know that they do. Maybe you have been in the same situation. One night I was writing about this in my journal and I had no idea that my thought spirals were really an attempt to be in control. I'm not a controlling person. Like, I don't think you would interact with me and go, man, she's controlling, right? Except in card games. Except in card games. I don't know that that's controlling, it's just she's winning. Well, okay. <laughs> Except I'm good, actually. <laughs> Maybe I need to read the book on humility. Yeah, come on. <laughs> Maybe. Okay. But I never connected mm. control and trust issues. Never yeah. did. Yeah, sure. But one night, as I was really trying to get to what is causing all of these thought spirals, I wrote down in my journal, what I don't trust I try to control. Yeah, wow. And so I want to read you a part from my book, I Want to Trust You, But I Don't. It doesn't sound so bad to try to control out-of-control situations, right? I mean, don't we all want to prevent bad things from happening as much as we can? Yes. But where I can slip into unhealthy patterns is trying to prevent what is beyond my ability to control. After all, I think if I can prevent bad things from happening, then I don't have to rely on or trust anyone else. I don't have to participate in that terrifying unknown of people making choices that mess everything up or put everything at risk. And I don't have to participate in that sometimes terrifyingly unknown of trusting God, who allows things that are so very confusing at best and devastating at worst. But my desire to control, it's an illusion or possibly a delusion. It's presumptuous of me and so very prideful to think I know what's best. And yet the most tender places of my heart, the ones that shake with fear because I can't stand the thought of another awful thing being added to my family story, just keep saying, please try Lisa, because maybe this time you are the one who can possibly hold it all together. Mm -hmm. And so, <laughs> Trust, I went on to write, it kind of feels like I'm betraying my best efforts to keep it all together while others aren't paying nearly enough attention to these things. So what I don't trust, I will try to control. And I don't physically try to control people, but here's what can so easily happen to me. I want to be able to think about all of the things that I can say to help bring the narrative back to what I think is best. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure that people know, like if you make this decision, I can see a train wreck happening down here. I can see the, barely, the train barreling towards you, and I'm not sure that you can see the, the train barreling towards you. Mm -hmm. And if the train hits you, it's also gonna impact me. Mm -hmm. And if the train hits you, it's also gonna impact me. And so it's not necessarily that I want to control what you do. I just want to control the things that feel out of control so that I can bring some sense of peace and security back into my life. Mm -hmm. Which and, I guess would be controlling, to use a term, the world, but you're really trying to control yourself. And I would want to honor for a moment, no matter what your motive or modus operandi is, you're really trying to keep yourself safe, don't you think? It's, even if you say it's unhealthy at one level, I watched that whole thing go out and then it came right back to you. 
I heard you say you want to keep yourself safe. I want to keep myself safe. Yeah. That's my Makes ultimate sense. motivation. But where I get in trouble is, and oftentimes my thought spirals and, and won't land, is because I'm trying to control something that is completely out of my control. I will thought spiral around the decisions that you're making. I mm. cannot control your decisions. Right. You, I can't control what you do, what you don't do. But if what you're doing is impacting me, then somehow I feel like my brain kind of tricks, like tricks myself sure. into believing, no, 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 there is something I can say. There is something I can do. There is something I can show him. There is something that, that a solution that I could possibly find that would make him finally wake up and go, wait, I'm making the wrong decisions here. And you're gonna feel good in the moment, again, back to that brain chemistry, because you're gonna be firing dopamine, likely to fire cortisol, the stress hormone in your bottle, body, there, there is a real sense of like what is a practical thing in the brain, soul, body of this is you will feel energized. I mean, even as I was watching you right there, you didn't look bored. It was like, I can do this. And I felt even the level vocally pitch up. And it's like, in that moment, I'm firing quite a bit of neurochemistry that I will get a buzz off of, right? It's very practical in the body. I don't know. I don't know if I feel a buzz off of it, but you're probably right. <laughs> It's like some kind of energy, and I don't know what to do with this energy. Yeah. And a lot of times it happens late at night, and so I will want to process Classic. with someone late at night. You know, I'm married now to an amazing man named Chaz, but he gets super tired at about 9 p.m. at night. <laughs> And if I and come he's got to the him, spiritual gift of napping, Lise. He, I, he I, does. I tell you what, he has a spiritual Chaz can gift nap of at like any time. he is a hundred percent. And then he's zero. <laughs> and so I, I, at night, sometimes I'll just be like, oh, no. Like, I just thought of something. And I'll start that spiral. I've got to control this. Because if I don't control this, if I don't, it, like, this is out of control. What can I do? What can I do? What can <clears throat> I do? And I will think in my mind, if we can just talk about it, mm -hmm. then I can just verbally process it, get it all out. Then it's going to fix things. But what often happens is he'll go, honey, that is not a 9 p.m. at night discussion. Let's, let's do it in the morning. Let's have that talk in the morning. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, that's nice because you're instantly going to fall asleep. But then I'm going to be sitting here <laughs> and I'm going to be thought spiraling all night long. And so recently we had one of these moments mm -hmm. and I'm like, no, it is a 9 p.m. conversation. You need to rally. You need to wake up mm -hmm. because we got to talk about this. We got to talk about this. And things didn't go well because obviously that late at night, nothing is going to be solved. Mm -hmm. And actually, my thought spiral, inviting someone into my thought spiral, often doesn't solve the issue. Mm -hmm. Because what's happening is I want to feel safe. That's what I want to feel safe. But instead of me verbalizing, I'm scared I'm not safe, I will say, let's keep talking about it. If we keep talking about it, I know we're going to land, we're going to land, we're going to land. And my thought spiral just keeps going on and on and on. And it frustrates whoever I'm having a conversation with. But not only that, it exhausts me because ultimately I come to the same conclusion every time. Which is? I cannot control what is outside of my ability to control. Okay, we interrupt this program for the following question. What did you do in that season? We talked about it. But when you were alone, and I know there would be a time you maybe not be able to reach a friend. I noticed, by the way, caveat, that you're trying melatonin in the body. You're trying to go to sleep. You might have been stimulated. You do like to play card games and things. And you're coming there with Chaz. I want to see Chaz next time. I'm seeing him say, Chaz, you need to put the words for me in there. Hey, 9 o'clock is not the time. Because truly in health, he would say, for me. Because you're like, oh, it's the right time for me. What did you do in a season when there was no one right there with you and you had the same thought spiraling? You had to do something with it. Well, I had to get my thoughts out. And because mm -hmm. I didn't have someone else to talk mm -hmm. and verbally process it with, I would often fill my journal up with Option those Option one. But now I feel like I want deeply to respect that 9 p.m. is not a great time of night to have my thought spirals and have an unrealistic expectation of Chaz to like want to talk about this for hours and hours and hours <laughs> because it's not even that I'm trying to get to a solution. Yeah. I just want to. You just want to process. I want to process it over and over and over and over. And what I'm really looking for is I'm safe, mm -hmm. but it's not another person telling me I'm mm -hmm. safe. Mm -hmm. 
I have to believe I'm safe for myself. Mm, and that's where the thought spiral just, nobody else can fix it. Like nobody else can tell me that I'm safe enough. I have to believe that for myself. Mm. And so I've learned that over-processing with someone else, processing is good, but over-processing, especially late at night, it's not going to fix it. It doesn't, does it, you, are you saying that tangibly it also doesn't even help you if you over-process it with Chaz? There, is there an element of that that it would actually not help you? Well, it helps me because I feel like then someone else can be invited into the stress I feel and oh, commiserate wow. with me. Share that cortisol right away. <laughs> <laughs> but I had an epiphany the other day. Oh, I can't wait. And this was really, really helpful. When I'm having those thought spirals, I have realized if I acknowledge what worst case scenario is, mm. and I acknowledge what best case scenario is, and I literally say out loud to myself, right now, this moment, it's not worst case scenario, it's not best case scenario, it's in the middle. So I gotta bring my thoughts mm. into the middle. And when I bring my thoughts into the middle, I'll say, is there something within my control I can do right now or add to my to-do list tomorrow? If there is, write it down. If there's not, that's where I have to literally physically close my eyes and mentally hand this over to the Lord. I as in surrender? As in surrender. That's a good I, word. I cannot control what this person says. I cannot control what this person does. I cannot control if this person gets elected or that person gets elected. I, I cannot control whatever mm. the diagnosis is about to be. I cannot mm. control my adult kids and what they do and what they don't do and what they think and what they don't think and how they act and, what, and how they don't act. Like I cannot control those things. So what is it that I can do right now in this minute? And bringing my thoughts back to this moment helps me so much because it helps me not run too far into the future or run too far into uh, like hoping for the best but dreading the worst, but rather acknowledging what is this moment? What can I do and what is out of my control to do? And that has helped me a lot. Well, you just saved money, truthfully. No, not being silly here at all. Uh, there is a book actually with this title, don't worry about it, that's called Self Therapy. I watched you just practice Nehemiah 5.7, just let it go. It's God's word. And so I took counsel with myself. People are missing. I mentor and counsel so many people. You've got to get off, off, off of just being dependent on the therapist. Take counsel with yourself. What is your count? I, I am amazed living there. I thought you found your therapist. It is not Jim Cress. It's you. Hmm. Therapeuo, right in Greek, thy heal. Then 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. There can be strongholds of thought spirals. Why not? And I demolish those. It's not Jesus coming to demolish those. I'm, it's not Chaz. By taking every thought, how many? I literally sit there and watch this. And I hope our viewers and our listeners caught that, that you were taking literally every, I watched you name them, every thought captive. And I know because of you and your faith, and you made them obedient to Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And you said, I, you landed the plane, said, thought, here you are, like me taking this pen and laying it on the word of God and saying, this is what's true. And then I watched you, even as you're on this podcast, self-regulate. You may not have caught that in yourself, mm -hmm. but as you were doing it, it's like, this is this, this is this, here's the messy middle, here's what's true, here's what I can control. And that's why I mean saving money in therapy. There are a lot of people, I want people out of the therapy office once they've done their work to do self-therapy and just go with yourself and tell yourself the truth, especially late at night. Remember one last thing, the body again is trying to go unconscious. It needs to defrag the hard drive. It needs to let go of control. We go unconscious literally when we fall asleep. So that's where a lot of people at night rise up and they're being able to control things because their body that keeps the score is saying, let go, go off to sleep. And it mimics our coming death one day. The old timers all knew that. I will yield and let go and go off into the un or subconscious. Just want to affirm you. I watched you do that. And if you can do it, I can do it, and I do, and Joel can do it, and he does. And every viewer and listener can start practicing that counsel with oneself. Well, thank you. I appreciate yeah, that, Yeah, I saw Joel. it happen. Joel, I want you to comment on this, but I do want to give you a second thought that has really helped me, and it comes from our good friend, Leslie Burning. Mm -hmm. And once I bring my thoughts back to the middle, 
and I say, okay, this is what I can do in this present moment. Mm -hmm. This is what I cannot do in this present moment. The second layer of question is, okay, what is my problem with their problem? Isn't that a great question? It's such a good question, and it comes straight from Leslie Burnick, and it has helped me so much. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, I can't control the decisions that they make. So I determine that's a problem. That's their problem. They are making these choices. But I can control what is my problem with their problem. Mm. And that gives me legs for something that I can put action to, not yes. trying to control another person, but assessing what I can do to bring a sense of control back to my world, to bring a sense of safety back to my world. And it's a much more productive place for my thoughts to go. What is my problem with their problem? And you're moving away. Uh, you know I'm full of metaphors and maybe other things too. But um, but it moving away from the magnifying glass of someone else's thing, whatever that is, to the mirror and to look. And God's word itself is a mirror and say, what is going on for me? And there's Proverbs 20, verse 5, isn't it? The purposes in a person's heart, my goodness, are deep waters. Mm. And a person of understanding goes down and draws them out. And I think one can be one's own per- person of understanding to say, what's my problem with their problem? And, and what's going, let me get the focus off them. Some of you know this experience of uh, adult children. Joel, Joel's children are not adults yet. And you think, you know, parenting and all this when they were younger and they might start rebelling or things. And then you realize how not powerful you are. And then they start having their own children and you want to go, I, w- d- I wouldn't do it. And it's that surrender around that. Mm. But the idea, so what does it mean if one of your kids rebelled or started going astray? I love to encourage people, as I encourage myself, Jimbo, what's going on in you? And I'm curious with myself and gentle, what's this hitting in you, buddy? Counseling myself, so as you do that, even as you're getting ready to go off to sleep or another time, or Leslie's words is, I just want to put the magnifying glass. It scares me what these people are doing. Matter of fact, I don't think that is wise. That's nothing wrong with that. But I want to say, what is this hitting in me? And I think that's where contemplation comes in, Mm -hmm. to really contemplate what's going on in my internal world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's so good. Um, You know, Jim, you mentioned 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Um, You know, Lisa, as I'm thinking through your story and kind of just that example, I do have one question before I get into this. When you say you take your thoughts and you bring them back to the middle, how would you like just simply in a sentence maybe define what is the middle? Okay, it's not best case scenario, it's not worst case scenario, but it's it's landing somewhere in between. Okay. Like, yeah, this is gonna be hard, but maybe it's not gonna be catastrophic. Mm-hmm. Um, or yes, this this could have a wonderful outcome, but even that wonderful outcome could come with challenges. So just bringing it back to more of a realistic, like it's not gonna be perfect and it's not gonna be catastrophic. It's gonna be somewhere in between. And there must be mystery, don't you hear that, Joel? That mm-hmm. she has to land in the middle here, the messy middle, the middle, with some mystery, which I even your body language to me looks like you're not trying to control. You're like, it's not this, it's not that. I have to be here, but you don't, you're not describing a concrete place, because there is a bit of concrete here or concrete there. Yeah. But here it's like embracing the mystery of like, I don't know. I wonder if faith rises up at that point. Yeah, I, I'm gonna say some stuff here. Um, and you know, as a, I guess as a theologian, sometimes I feel like I get tasked, like, I probably am not gonna say the thing that you want to hear. <laughs> I know. I, <laughs> like right I, now, I coming right now? <laughs> but it, I'm just gonna try to share what the text says. Yes, you have permission <laughs> to speak truth into the depths of my overthinking soul. <laughs> well, it's for you, it's for me, it's for Jim, it's really for, for all of us. And I think what you just described there, which this is all happening in real time, so you know I'm gonna process it with my friends here. Um, bringing your thoughts and bringing them back into the middle is actually uh, the exercise of 2 Corinthians 10.5. And, and what Paul says is, and every proud thing, the, the Greek word here is hypsoma, it, it has to do with um, height or lofty mm-hmm. ideas. That, that's what pride is. Mm-hmm. Pride is taking us to the heights and it's suggesting to us that from the heights we can see incredibly clear, but actually what it's doing is it's taking us to the heights that it can push us off the cliff. Mm. Wow. Right? Nice. And, and we will see clearly, but we're gonna see the ground come crashing into our faces. Mm. Wow. Right? So, so look at the language, and every proud thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God, mm-hmm. and then this is kind of the operative phrase here. We take every thought 
captive, period? No, there's no That's period. where secular psychology stops, nothing against they it. They do. Thought stopping that's and, taught. And then it's and a, that's there's it. a period there. There's no period. That's right. Right? There's a few more words right after that. Mm-hmm. Well, well, what is the, the captive part? And this is, I think, what you're talking about, Jim, with the mystery. And Lisa, what you're saying, uh, bring this thought to the middle, to, to the obedience. Obedient to Christ. I mean, that's it. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I want to actually pick up uh, earlier because the, the um, pericope or the section should probably start in verse 3. For although we live in the flesh, so here's an honest um, admission that we are fleshly people. We live in the flesh. So although we live in the flesh, we don't wage war according to the flesh. Since the weapons of our warfare are not the flesh, but are powerful through God for the demolition of strongholds, we demolish arguments and every proud thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. The historical social context, if you were in the city of Corinth um, and you're you know, with the Corinthians in this church and you're hearing this letter being read out loud, instantly you're thinking about your history of warfare. Hmm. Instantly wow. you're thinking about siege warfare. And you're thinking like, wait a minute, how do we take things captive? The only way we can take things captive is to deal with the um, watchtowers around and the cannons, right? So there's this sense that in order to even get to the captivity of thoughts, we have to deal with the things that are um, offensively attacking against us. And I think what you did for us in that example is you actually help us to determine the difference between what I want to suggest biblically and theologically is um, control which is only actually able to be done by God mm-hmm. and stewardship, which is given to us. Oh, so, so good. Beautiful wording. So, too. so what, do I, what do I mean? Okay. Control is power, authority, and the ability to exercise that power and authority in any way that you wish and to have the outcome that you desire. Almost mm-hmm. like playing God, maybe. I mean— it Maybe, is. Like, that's exactly. Like. <laughs> that's exactly what it is. Well, I mean, when I'm having my thought spirals, I'm not like, oh, I want to play God. Except I do want outcomes that I want. Which is? Which is playing, playing God. God. <laughs> okay, so I'm just, again, I'm just trying to be honest <laughs> with, okay, well, with the word. Me, I'm just going to reach down and rub my toes really quick. <laughs> is that grounding you? Is that helping you get back in? I don't know. It's just that Joel keeps stepping on them. So. <laughs> I'm not I'm like, not you're physically, back. emotionally. You're oh, on my toes. Uh, <laughs> For the listeners who cannot see, Blessing. oh, that was good. And there's room in this. Obviously, we're, we're laughing and as friends here and talking as we often do. I have to leave room for me and what Lisa's saying of the subconscious. I'm not sitting there thinking, oh, I now seize control of the scepter and the throne, the crown. Nevertheless, as I quiet my soul, I think, yeah. I was trying to do something that might be God's doing, not mine. And then I can repent gently and say. Lord, I, Job did it. My mm-hmm. ears have seen you, heard of you, heard of you. Now my eyes see have you. seen you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I go. Yeah, God, I did it again. He just Papa Father smiles. Says, you think that's breaking news to me? And I go. I was trying to control. I didn't know I was doing it. So the thing that um, I think that Second Corinthians ten five is doing for us, and Lisa's, you're joking about, you know, getting our, our feet kind of stepped on, is it is inviting us into an honest um, assessment inventory. Mm-hmm. Um, so good. So what is the assessment inventory? Um, what are the things in our life that we're trying to manhandle control over? And, and or direct toward the outcome that we the, really think is I best. I like that one. Exactly. That's nuanced. Yes. That's you know, good. because that that for me, it's like, oh, I can so clearly see how this how this can be okay, how this can be safe, how this can turn out with a much better outcome. And so I just it's not that I want to like grab everybody and force them. It's just I just want to like ee, 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 back over here, like head in this direction because yeah. I see things that I'm afraid you don't see. Yeah. And so have these thoughts, you know, like yes. like consider this narrative. Yes. Like maybe consider these actions. You yes. look like a bit of a seriously. I use this term like a relational chiropractic person. Mm-hmm. I'm trying mm-hmm. to real. Let me let me realign. Get you, let me realign. Get things going. Yeah. Or like when yeah. you're bowling, you know, I want to be the, the little things. And nobody's going to go in the gutter. Like, you're free to go anywhere you want to. I hate those things. But you are not going to, let's don't go in <laughs> so the gutter. Why? You know what I mean? Because if you score a real. strike, it's not real. It's not even real. I know, but it is so much Feels safer. good in the moment. <laughs> it really does. We'll have a, need a therapy session about it later. But here's the type of things I'm talking about with control. It's like you can't have the gutters. Like, like, like as much as I we know. want the gutters, right? Like, But I love where you're going here, Joel, because mm, 
There's a big difference between control, control and, and stewardship. stewardship. Because stewardship is still going to leave room for me to be responsible. Mm-hmm. And I no want doubt. to be responsible. And yep. sometimes I think, <clears throat> okay, I don't want to control, so I just have to let it all go. But mm-hmm. that's not what you're saying. No, um, control, again, is something uniquely of what God can only do in totality. Um, and so it might be just a good opportunity to take just an inventory of things that we have in our lives that we're trying to, and again, like you said, comfortably, compassionately, honestly, just say, oh, wow, through self-reflection, these are some things that I'm, that I'm trying to do that is actually outside of my means. And the more that we try to do things that are outside of our means, the end result is not peace, it's anxiety. It's frustration, right? Stewardship is actually, uh, theologically, stewardship is the sense that God who is in total control has given us responsibility and vocation, and now we ought to be responsible with the things that have been given to us, which recognizes our human limits. So stewardship is a gift for us because stewardship allows us to do what we can with what we have in the means that we have. And anything that is outside of our means or things that we don't have are things that we're not required to be stewards over. And so we have to be really careful with that. And so you might just say, oh, what are some things in my life that I'm trying to control that are actually not things that are even mine to control? And what are some things that I actually ought to steward that God has given to me, but I actually might be neglecting those things because I'm so busy, consumed, trying to control the things that I have no control over. Mm. Um, and in so doing, this is what is being acted out. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, we're taking captive these thoughts that could derail us and instead were to, with your language, bring them back into the middle. And the mystery of this is when we bring it back into the middle, we don't try to control it. We don't try to try to force it into one of these lanes. We bring it to in obedience to Christ. He's the one who brings rule and reign over it. Hmm. Can I share a quote I made up? It's an Instagram post and it's a gymism, so I don't know how good this one, but I liked it. And some people seem to like it. And it's just simple, if I can remember it, sorry. Uh, when I try, I have a, control, a picture of a game controller on my Instagram post. When I try to control what I cannot control, I will be controlled by what I cannot control. Hmm. So it's both, or because I am one of the biggest controllers, like I want to control, you know, a moment ago we had a small little edit because the TV went on some screensaver thing and I got to control by going up and touch screening the thing. I like the remote control. But when I try to control what I really cannot control, then I will be controlled hmm. by what I cannot control. And the biggest place that's ever gotten me, not you two, but is parenting. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And I have to realize, mm. wow, that agency that even our kids have, or in this betrayal series we're doing, and trust series, uh, I will do all I can to control my spouse from not acting out in infidelity, or once they do, I will control, no one knows this one, right? I will control that they will never for sure go act out again. I will be enough this. And then you have foolish people who are out there saying, well, if you just give them more sex, or if you do more of this, or if you would do this, and or what's your- And they're encouraging you to try yeah. to control things. It's, it's absolutely, and, and it's like- And that's the, not control, this manipulation. Well, they're, then if one betrays oneself, believe it or not, because they wake and I threw everything in, Stonewall Jackson said, throw everything into the fight, I did it all. I mean, I crossed T's and dotted I's, and I did everything, and they betrayed me again. Mm-hmm. And that's a setup versus a yielding of, Cannot, you know, and, and we know this, but our, our buddy Chaz and your husband Chaz knows this well because of his own admission of recovery, right? I'm a 12 stepper myself too in recovery. And there's the idea I do inventory work. I look, I got to make it about me. Do we tell people, this is from the 12 steps real quick, don't take somebody else's inventory. You're over this obsessed with what he needs, Joel needs to do in his life. Where's your own inventory? You come back and go, okay. What do I need to do here? Mm. In the middle, sure, but what do I need to do here? Mm, So good. Well, let's end with this because um, I I think this is also coming back to that. Am I being a steward of this or am I trying to control this? I have to be careful that I don't run into the future mentally, like run into the future, determine what is best, and then try to hold everyone accountable, including God, to what my version of the best is. Mm -hmm. Instead, what I have to do is recognize I've got to be right here in this moment. I can make wise decisions by considering the future, 
but I can't run into the future, write a script, and then try to hold God accountable to the script that I've written of how things should go. And I think one of the best ways that I can do that is to recognize, yes, God may not have this future in mind. Mm. It may be different, but just because it's different doesn't mean it's bad. Yeah. Different can still be good. Anything we place in God's hands will not return void. Mm. Anything we place. So if I place my future in God's hands, it may look different, but when it's in God's, hand, God's hands, it's not bad. Yeah. It's, it's just good. different.